Good morning. Good morning. My name is Griff Caracello, and it is my privilege to welcome all of you here to Sharon United Methodist Church. I'm the pastor here, uh, and I want to wish all of our fathers a happy Father's Day. Uh, today is a special day. We also recognize that today, for some, may be a difficult day um, for various different reasons. And so we, we want to make sure that we wish you a happy Father's Day, but also to let you know that if today is maybe not the happiest days, or if today is maybe a, a slightly more difficult day, please know that we are praying for you uh, and we are here for you. If you're new to our church, we are so glad that you are here. I would love for you to find one of the Connect cards in the pews um, or to use the QR code in your bulletin to connect with us and help us take your, uh, help you take your next step here at this church. Uh, we would love for you to do that. And while you do that, I have several announcements for you this morning. The first is that Vacation Bible School is about a month or so away. It'll be from July 16th through the 20th. So if you haven't already registered your kid, please be sure to do so. But also, we are looking for volunteers as well. So uh, I, I know for some, they've seen uh, VBS at work. They've seen Vacation Bible School and all of its beautiful chaos at times. And so you may be a little hesitant to say, oh, I don't know if I'm the person to be involved in that chaos. Well, the good news is, is that you are. You are the absolutely the necessary person that we need to make sure that this Vacation Bible School is a meaningful experience for the kids that may have no church home, for the people that are looking for a safe opportunity to learn about Jesus. And so we would love for you to volunteer, to talk with me, to talk to Kelly or Amy about the opportunities. For example, you may be nervous that if you volunteer that Kelly is going to put you in charge of the, the third graders or something like that. And you can't imagine yourself being in charge of those third graders. Well, the good news is, is that we have all the lead teachers in place already, or all the lead guides in place already. So maybe you would be assisting that lead teacher, that lead guide. Or maybe you might be helping out in the science or the crafts area uh, to help out here or there, or maybe even the kitchen. I, I don't know exactly where, but we just we need several people's help when it comes to pulling off this VBS to make sure that the kids that are here have a meaningful and wonderful experience that one day they may look back on and say, this was the turning point in my faith in Jesus Christ. So if you haven't already volunteered, we would love for you to do so. So talk to me, talk to Kelly or Amy. Um, they are more than happy to have those forms right in your hands, and they will stare at you until you fill them out. So we would love to have you volunteer. Uh, the next two announcements are just real quick. On July 2nd, we're going to have a combined worship service at 10 a.m. We'll be here in this uh, sanctuary. Uh, it'll be a blended service between the two uh, worship services, our contemporary and our traditional. So please be sure to make a plan to join us for that. The other thing happening on July 2nd is that the Crossfire Student Ministry will be having a cookout over at Gray's House at 6 o'clock. Uh, it'll be a fun evening, um, I assume... David is probably going to cook for y'all, is that right? So you don't have to worry about great cooking. It'll be good food. If you have any questions or if you're wondering whether or not your student uh, can come over, they can, but talk to Gray for any further details. He'll be happy to help you and point you in the right direction for that. So there are just a few things going on in the life of the church. Summer doesn't really slow down for us too terribly much here at Sharon. So I hope that you will be able to find your place to volunteer or serve uh, to help us further the mission that God has given us. And so, with all that said, look in your bulletin. There are several other things that are going on. But at this time, I want to invite you to stand as we join together in our worship service.
You may be seated. At this time, I want to invite the Walsh family to come forward. Uh, today is a special day. Earlier in our 9 o'clock service, we had Matt McCrate, who some of you have met before. He's our guitarist. He joined our church after about two or so years of attending and helping us lead worship. And now here at the 11 o'clock service, we will have the Walshes join. I was told that they were a little nervous about this and about what they were supposed to say, <laughs> even though I kind of walked them through it a, a little bit earlier. But we are excited to have you all uh, uh, making the decision to take those next steps within the faith journey. So uh, on behalf of the whole church, I have several questions for you, and we'll start with this one. I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, please say, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, please say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ is your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, please say, I do. I do. According, to Christ, according to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve uh, as Christ's representatives in this world? If so, please say, I will. Do you, church, as Christ's body, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? Let us all join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified. believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Walsh, as I have just a couple more questions for you. As members of Christ's Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, please say, I will. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, please say, I will. I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons now before you to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Heidi, Avery, Dylan, Sean, we are so glad that you are a part of the sharing community now, and we just want to say welcome to the family. At this time, I want to invite you to greet those around you with Christ's peace and come and welcome your new family members in Christ.
it is it is a blessing to be a part of a church where we are seeing more and more people make the decision to become members of our congregation not just at this service but also at our early service and much of that is due to the ministries of the church that we have ministries that are continuing to reach out to our community to build those bridges and it's also ministries that you yourself take on throughout the week um, and so we are grateful for that and we're grateful to be a part of a church that god continues to bless and so now as we continue our worship in response to god's blessing to us we have an opportunity to worship god through our uh, financial offerings and so at this time I want to invite our ushers to come forward for the giving of God's tithe and our offering. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we respond to your grace towards us in our lives with these offerings to you. Use them according to your will. Use them to invite others to new life in Christ so that we could see within our community those from every background come to new life and experience a life with you rather than a life apart from you. And so, Lord, we surrender these tithes and offerings to you, asking that you would use them for your glory. And we ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you continue to remain standing as we sing our next hymn, Oh, How I Love Jesus.
You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for how you have been at work in our lives. And we give you thanks for your love that you shared with us before we ever loved you. For Lord Jesus, you turned toward us before we could ever turn toward you. You gave us unmerited, undeserved grace in our lives. And for that, we give you thanks. But we are reminded today that you not only saved us from our sin, but saved us for a purpose. That not only did you save us from our brokenness, but you saved us for a mission that provides healing and wholeness to those all around us. Days like today, we gather here in this sanctuary to find a place of peace and rest, to find a place where we could listen to your voice, to find a place where we can experience that life that only comes from you. And so in this time, revive us, give us life, and remind us of the purpose that you have called us to. That when we leave these, th this sanctuary and we enter into a world filled with brokenness, that we will be your messengers of grace, of truth, and of your love. Help us to be messengers of your gospel that provides such a power within our lives that others may look upon us and see your face. Lord, whether, it is, whether we enter into hospitals, whether we enter into classrooms, whether we enter into our workspaces, we are surrounded by hurt and pain. Help us to be your presence in those places. And today, as many experience both celebration but also grief, remind us to care for those who are around us, to care for those who may be grieving the loss of their father, who may be dwelling on the thoughts of an absentee parent who may be dwelling upon the, fact, the part where their father has grown sick over the years. Lord, into those places of grief and pain, give us courage to step into those places and to share your love, a love that never fails, a love that is always faithful, and a love that meets us even in our depths. Lord, hear our prayer this day as we join together as your church in a unified voice, praying the prayer that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Don't jump ahead too much, okay? Wait till I ask you some questions about it. Then you can tell me all about it. Well, no, it wasn't in class, but I'm going to put Chelsea on the spot for a minute. You were the only one here last week when Miss Kelly told a story about a man who tried to do something. Do you remember? He was trying to run away from God. That's right. Do you remember what his name was? Started with a J. Do y'all know somebody from the Bible whose name starts with a J? It might be. No, was it? John. Nope. Nope. It's not a name you hear a lot. Nope. Those are some good guesses. His name was Jonah. Now, do you remember Jonah? Oh, uh, I know it's okay. name's Jonah. All right, well, like Chelsea said, he tried to run away from God. Do you know why? Why was he trying to run away from? No. He didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. Do you know what God wanted him to do? That's right. He wanted Jonah to go somewhere and talk about him, talk about God. <coughs> Oh, hold on. Don't get too far ahead. Because like I said, I know you know that story. So, he tried to run away, and he tried to hide. Now, I want you to think about if you were trying to hide in this church somewhere. Where do you think you would go hide? What's the best place to hide? You're not going to say. Where would you go hide? Okay. Where would you hide? Under the pews? Where would you hide? Under the pews? If you're going to hide and then someone in the church says, let's go talk with them, then they'll be going to hide. Think about the places when we play hide and seek downstairs. Some of you have found some good places downstairs. Uh, but now some of you haven't been found before when we play hide and seek. But who's always going to find you? So can you really run away and hide from him? Would well, you know where Jonah tried to hide? Yep. Where? You're right. He tried to hide in the bottom of a ship. But then, what happened? Uh, what came? A storm. Yes, a big storm came. How would you feel if you were in the bottom of a ship and you were in a storm and the boat was... Yeah, I, I wouldn't like that either. I just get out of the boat. Well, all the sailors and all the people on that ship tried to go hide, too, to get away from the storm so they could be safe. And guess what? They found Jonah. And they wanted to find out who he was. They were blaming him for what had happened. And when they found him, they asked him who he was. And so he told him he was a worshiper of God and that he didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. And then they thought, well, God was punishing Jonah and sent that storm. So then, what, did, what was he going to do? He told them to throw him overboard so that the, uh, the storm would stop. But what happened? A giant, a giant, fish. A giant fish swallowed him. Do you know how many days um, he was in that fish? Three days and three nights. So while he was in that, sh in, in that fish, he was thinking, he was praying, he was trying to figure out what to do, and then he realized he was wrong for trying to hide and run from God. 
and he promised he was gonna he promised God he was gonna go and tell people and he asked for forgiveness. So then what did God make the fish do? He spit him out. And so then where did Jonah go? See, I knew y'all would know that story. So just like God had something he wanted Jonah to do, God has something in mind for you as well. You might not you might not know it yet. You might know it, but at some point God knows what he wants you to do. Just like one thing for me, Miss Kelly talked about her being called to be a children's director. I was scared and wanted to hide the first time I had to come up here and do a children's message. I don't like talking in front of people. I might talk in front of kids all day long at school, but when I have to talk to those adults back there, I don't like doing that. So I wanted to go run and hide, but could I? No. No. That's right. I came out and did it. And I still don't really like to do it, but that's why I look at y'all the whole time I do it, because then I can do it, right? <laughs> All right. Before you leave, I do have a little treat for you to help you remember the story, but let's say a little prayer first. Dear Lord, thank you for sending your son to die for our sins so that when we do something wrong, we can come to you and confess. We thank you because we don't ever have to hide from you and to be alone and lost. In your name we pray. Amen. Get a big fish. One year, when I was in elementary school, I decided to do something a little different. I decided to take a, a bit of a risk in my elementary school career and something out of the ordinary in my life. What I decided to do was to try out to audition for our elementary school choir. Now, here's the thing. I went to a Catholic elementary school where uh, the nuns weren't there anymore, but you know they were generally nice, so I thought that this was going to be a no-brainer thing. And I wasn't the only one because everybody seemed really excited about these auditions for the elementary school choir. There was a lot of buzz in the air. There was a lot of excitement uh, in the coming days as the audition day kept getting closer and closer. And eventually, the day finally came. And thankfully, we went like one at a time, so we didn't have to audition in a group of uh, 20 or so kids at a time. So we went one at a time, and then finally my time came up to go and audition for this choir. And the audition went, came and went, and the chorus teacher was sitting at her piano on her piano bench, and she spun around to look at me and said, Griff, listen, <laughs> this might not be the thing for you, but tell you what, we'll think about it and we'll call you. Well, she never called. I didn't make it. Everybody else in my class made it except for one other person. And that person didn't even try out for the choir. Aww. Yeah, I know. And so it was in that moment where I just saw my singing career just vanish before my eyes. That I was going to be a part of this boy band when I grew up, and it just, it wasn't going to happen anymore. And so from that tryout, it lodged into my mind that I just simply wasn't good enough. I, I was crushed. I got over it pretty quickly, but I was crushed in the moment. So I'm... Uh, thank you, Deb. Thank you. Y'all won't kick me out of your choir, right? So, so uh, I'm certain I'm not the only one that has had a similar experience before. Perhaps it's an audition. Perhaps it's a tryout. Perhaps it's just simply an interview along the way. That we've all experienced that one place or another where we've had to show our best selves. And probably at times along the way, we have been told, listen, this isn't for you. Come back when you're a little bit better. Come back and we'll give you another shot and maybe the answer will be yes. I think that 
thinking or that experience is so ingrained in many of us is that we almost look at life as an audition from time to time. That we look at it almost like a tryout or an interview before God. That we have to act a certain way, we have to put our best selves forward, we have to do this or that in order for God to earn God's attention or in order to earn God's yes toward us. That we have to prove ourselves worthy for God's grace. And perhaps in our lives we've been told so many, no so many times that we just simply expect for God to tell us no if we were ever to approach him at all. Perhaps it's this image of God that we have had for many years, or perhaps it's just his followers, those church-going people that have made us think that, uh, that God is going to look at us and say, listen, come back when you have your life together. Come back when everything is put back together. Come back when you act a little bit more like you should, and then maybe we can talk about what's next. Sometimes we have that image of God in our lives. But is that really the God that we see in Scripture? Is that really how God acts? We're in this sermon series called The Runaway, where we're taking a look at the book of Jonah. And the book of Jonah is about a prophet named Jonah. And so Jonah, this whole book, is about Jonah's wrestling with God. And just to remind you, a prophet is not somebody that is uh, someone that tells the future or looks into the future and predicts these visions and predicts all of these things. While that is part of what a prophet does, what a prophet's job mostly is someone who is called by God in order to give a message to God's people. So essentially, a prophet is a messenger of God. That's what a prophet does. Well, last week we looked at chapter 1, and we saw that the call of God happened upon Jonah's life, and Jonah ran. He ran the opposite direction of that call. He ran away from God to try to put as much distance between himself and God as much as possible, goes out on the open sea, and where we left off last week was that Jonah, in the midst of this incredible storm, was thrown overboard by the sailors. Surely, to drown in the sea and to die. Except, that's not at all what happens. And so let's read what happens in the next verse. It's in verse chapter, oh, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 17. So we'll start there, and then I'll read the rest of chapter 2. This is what the book of Jonah says. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to, God, to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. For deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. So in week two of the Runaway series, this is what I want you to remember. God doesn't wait. He initiates. God doesn't wait, he initiates. God doesn't wait, he initiates. In the last chapter, we, we saw Jonah being thrown into the sea. A sea that is being tossed, uh, tossed and turned over and over again by this powerful storm that was caused by a wind that God threw upon it. And surely we expect that Jonah is going to, be, uh, is going to drown in the sea. 
And to be honest, some people see this almost like a noble act of Jonah to self-sacrifice himself for the sake of the sailors in order that they may live and he may perish because he did something wrong. But there's also another way to look at it. That Jonah, in his selfishness, in his desperate uh, desire to run away from God, threw himself overboard to get even further away from God as possible. And in essence, what it is is that Jonah would choose to die, to drown and die, rather than turn back toward God. So surely, as we think about this, as we think about the God who uh, we, we imagine sometimes that wants us to try out, wants us to have this audition, wants, waits on us to get our life together, surely the person that God would do this the most with is the prophet that would run away from him. That if God was going to wait on anyone, to get their life together, it would be Jonah. If God were going to wait on somebody to repent, to pray to them, to change their mind, surely it was going to be Jonah that God was going to exercise this kind of waiting game on. Perhaps we'd think that Jonah or God would wait for Jonah to repent, to pray, to get it together. But within the story, that's not at all what we see. That's not at all what happens here. Instead, a very different story unfolds. Because after Jonah is thrown into the sea, as Jonah sinks further and further into the sea, God inter intervenes in this story. He interrupts this story. And as it says in verse 17 of chapter 1, God provided a large fish for Jonah. God provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. Surely at this point we're thinking, all right, God provides this large fish in order to swallow up Jonah so that Jonah will die and face the punishment that he deserves. But that's not at all what happens. For God provides this fish not in order to kill Jonah, but to rescue Jonah. That he provides this fish as a way of salvation. That God provides this rescue before Jonah even prays to God. What we see here in this chapter is that God doesn't wait. He initiates. While Jonah is in the fish for three days and three nights, Jonah prays a prayer. Jonah finally responds to what God has done in his life, and he prays this prayer that is filled with this language that comes from the Psalms. It com it's language that comes from Scripture. And in this prayer, Jonah recounts his journey from verses 3 down to 6. What Jonah does is he prays this prayer that tells the story of his running away from God, and not just running away from God, but his gradual descent down into the depths of the sea. That it's his gradual descent down into and further away from God. That he starts out in the sea, but eventually grows, goes further and further down, and essentially what he is recounting it's his prayer that he thought he was done for. That because of the choices that he had made, because of, those, because of those consequences, he believed that he was going to drown and die. Far from the temple, far from God, far from everything else he loved, Jonah was going to die alone. But God provided. That as the bars of death, as the bars of Sheol, the, the afterlife, began to close around him, Jonah prays in his prayer that God brought up my life from the pit. That when it seemed like the thing, uh, seemed like all hope was lost, yet the Lord my God brought my life out of the pit. That before Jonah ever prayed, or repented, God provided rescue. This is unmerited, undeserved grace at work. In the final words of the prayer, Jonah confesses, or, or maybe he remembers the heart of God. He remembers the character of God because he says, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. That salvation belongs with no one else, that only God is the one who can save. 
that God doesn't wait to begin the work of salvation. He initiates it. And at the heart of Jonah is a question about who God is and what, God, what God's salvation actually looks like. And what we see here in the story is that God's, God will save who God wants to. God will extend his grace to those he wants to. God doesn't wait, but he initiates. Before, God, before Jonah ever prayed or repented, God extended and provided rescue for him. In other words, you could think of it this way, is that God said yes to Jonah before Jonah could ever say yes to God. That God said yes to Jonah before Jonah could ever say yes to God. In the Methodist world, we call this grace, but we call this a very particular kind of grace. It's called provenient grace. Now, provenient grace is this big old word that basically means the grace that comes before. The grace that comes before our decision. The grace that comes before our yes to God. The grace that comes before our loving of God. It's this idea that God has extended grace to everyone. That it was this kind of grace that was extended to Jonah before he ever repented or ever prayed. And it's this kind of grace that is extended to every single one of us here. Now because of our sinful nature... Because of the power of sin in our lives, we were unable to turn toward God. We were unable to ever choose God. We were in a helpless situation. We were in a situation that was hopeless for us. We were in a situation where we were powerless. But God provided. But God provided because God turned toward us. God chose us. God loved us before we could ever turn toward him, choose him, or love him. Out of his love for us, God provided and extends his grace to us, even while we are yet sinners, so that we might accept this grace to experience new life that is offered by Jesus Christ. This concept of provenient grace changes the way that we look at God. And we can think of it this way, is that provenient grace is a lot like gravity. Gravity is something that every single one of us is experiencing in our day-to-day -day lives. It's something that every single one of us is experiencing right here in this moment. But you may not be aware of it. You may have grown used to it. You may are, are maybe in some ways ignoring it. But each one of us experiences the pull and the tug of gravity upon our lives because without gravity, we would be floating off into space. We, would have no, we wouldn't have our two feet on the ground. But gravity keeps us grounded. It keeps us where we are. And there are certain moments where we feel the power of gravity a little bit more within our lives, where we feel the power of gravity pulling us and keeping us grounded upon the earth. In the very same way, God's provenient grace is like that power of gravity. That every single one of us has experienced that power of grace in our lives. We just may not know it. It is a power that is at work in our lives, continuing to pull at us, to tug at us, to drag us back, kicking and screaming to the God that loves us. And it was a power, it is a gift, it is a grace that is offered to us before we could ever offer anything to God. Provenient grace is a lot like gravity, to where each one of us, if we pay attention, can notice that power of grace drawing us closer to God. Because God loves us. And God wants to have a loving and a living relationship with every single one of us. No matter where we find ourselves today. You are living with the consequences of all the choices in your life. Some of those consequences are good. And some of them are bad. 
But regardless of that, God's grace continues to tug at you to bring you back to God. That perhaps some of the choices that you have made, perhaps because of some of those consequences, perhaps because of the place that you feel like you are right now, you feel as though you're not good enough. That you're not worth loving. That perhaps you may not feel like you are in the belly of a fish, but instead you feel as though you are in a dark place. In a place that is hopeless. In a place that is helpless. Perhaps you feel like you're in such a dark place that you feel like you are drowning and that you are so far away from God. And worst of all, that mindset of God being this person that is waiting for you to audition, that is waiting for you to try out, for waiting for you to complete your interview, only to simply tell you that you're not good enough for his grace, that is haunting you at this moment. That you imagine that God is there telling you that you are not good enough for my love, that you are not good enough for my grace. So go back to where you came, put your life back together, and then we can have a conversation. But what we see in Jonah and what we see in Jesus Christ and what we see throughout Scripture is that this is not the way that God operates because God doesn't wait on us to get our lives together before he enters into our life. God doesn't wait on us to become good people before he gives us his grace. Instead, God initiates this process, initiates that gift, and initiates this plan of salvation that brings about a change in our lives so that even though we are broken, even though we are in the depths, even though we are in a place that we would rather not be, God still enters into that place to bring our lives out of the pit to experience that love. God loved us before we could ever love him. And God doesn't wait to get involved into our lives. He initiates it. This is unmerited, undeserved grace. Several years ago, there were a few inmates that broke out of a prison in western Tennessee. One of them was uh, named Riley. And Riley, along the way, got separated from the other inmates, and he found a shotgun and eventually forced entry into a home, a home that was, uh, belonged to an elderly couple. And he forced his entry, and he held the couple at gunpoint, threatening to kill them uh, because he was on the run. Now, Louise, the elderly woman in this couple, looked at this young man and said, young man, I am a Christian lady, and I don't believe in no violence. So put that gun down, and you sit down, because I don't allow no violence in here. The man, a little startled by that, relaxed his grip just a little bit, but eventually relented and put his shotgun down on the couch, and eventually... He said, looked at the, the, the elderly lady, and he said quietly, Lady, I'm so hungry. I haven't had nothing to eat for three days. So Louise looked at him and said, You sit down right there, and I'll fix you something to eat. So Riley sat down at the table, and Louise went to work fixing him bacon and eggs and toast and milk and coffee and eventually Louise set out this beautiful table set out the nice tablecloth set out the wonderful china that she had got out the real nice napkins for Riley and she and Riley and her husband all sat down at this table and Louise reached out and took this man's hand and said son let's give God thanks let's give God thanks that you came here and that you are safe so there at that table, they prayed and ate breakfast together. And afterwards, she continued to hold his hand and patted him on his knee and looked at him and said, Listen, son, I love you. And God loves you so much. God loves us all, every single one of us, and especially you. Because you know what? Jesus Christ died for you because he loves you so much. And they continued to pray together. About that time, 
outside the doors, they started, started to see the blue lights flashing and hear cop cars pulling into the driveway or surrounding the house. And Riley stood up real quick and started panicking and said, oh God, they're going to kill me when they find me in here. And then Louise, the 73-year-old lady, stood up and said, son, they're not going to kill you. You just sit right here and let me do all the talking. So she got up, walked out her door, and her husband and Riley could hear her talking to the cops saying, listen, y'all, y'all put those guns down because I'm a Christian lady and I don't allow no violence here. Unmerited, undeserved grace. God has already given his grace to all of us. God has already given his grace to those in this world. God doesn't hold back selfishly, but offers it freely and generously to everyone. God's grace is always working and always tugging away at us, and especially in surprising ways. So I want you to ask a couple of questions in this coming week. To think about these questions, to ponder these. And the first is this, where have I already seen God's grace, God's unmerited, undeserved grace in my life? Where have I already seen God's unmerited, undeserved grace in my life? Perhaps it's in a word that a friend shared with you. Perhaps it's in an unexplainable moment in, of worship that you just had a few moments ago. Perhaps it's a moment where you have felt a holy discontent, a holy frustration within your life as God is nudging you toward his call upon your life. Where have you seen God's unmerited, undeserved grace in your life? Yet I don't want us to just stop there. Because we believe that God has extended his grace to all people. That God has offered his grace freely to everyone before they ever prayed, before they've ever repented. God has offered his grace to everyone in our lives. And so in a world that is filled with people that think that God is auditioning them or that their, that their life is simply an interview in order to get into the afterlife or just simply those people that feel like they are so far away from God, that they are so far, their choices have led them to the deepest waters and to the darkest depths, we have a duty to help them see where God already loves them. So I want you to ask this of yourself as well. How can I help others see God's grace already in their lives? How can I help others see God's grace already in their life? Perhaps it's through a kind word. Perhaps it's through an act of service. Perhaps it's through just simply sharing a gift or perhaps just simply sharing your time with them. But how can you help others see God's grace already at work in their life. Ultimately, the question that we are asking is how, how can I help others see that God doesn't wait on them? He initiates. How can I help others see that God doesn't wait? He initiates. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing our final hymn, Nothing But the Blood.
receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you as you go out into this world to be reminders and messengers to those who are far from God, that God doesn't wait. He initiates. Amen. Amen.